Hey you guys, Irene here. Welcome to this video. Welcome to this YouTube channel. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I answered a question in a longer Facebook Live that I did. It was a Q&A call in relationship to my healing trauma video series. So I've linked up all those pieces below this in the show more section. Now, I answer in this longer Q&A the question, which is, how does one come out of the freeze response? This is not a quick and easy answer to dive into, it, or question I should say, the answer is complicated and it takes a little bit of time to explain it because we are not simple creatures. So in this YouTube video, you will get an overview of sort of the three things that we need to pay attention to and understand and practice so we can come out of a freeze response or really in many ways it's being in a chronic freeze throughout our entire life, which is usually a result of trauma, adversity, stress, and all of the above. So enjoy this video, take good care. So the question that I actually posed was, how does someone come out of freeze? There isn't one answer, okay? So again, if you haven't watched the healing trauma videos, make sure you watch them because it forms, it's kind of like, understanding basic math before doing calculus. You need to understand the basics first. The freeze response, fight, flight, freeze. That's, if I use this fun toy again, right? This is called a Hoberman sphere. You can get it at a toy store. Um, it's shut down. So the system is literally like, it's tight, it's shut down, it's frozen. What's interesting, it isn't being like passed out. The extreme of shutdown is like the idea of, a, of like playing possum. If you've ever uh, Googled possum, don't do that right now. Maybe do it afterwards. The possum response is a very unique one. And as soon as they feel any threat, they literally fall over and they're like frozen. That's an extreme of fear. Many people are living semi-functional kind of lives in some form of shutdown response, but they're still awake, they're still conscious, they're still able to go through university, be medical doctors, right? Parent, kind of. So when someone is in some spectrum of freeze that is putting their system into a compromised health space, I talked about this at the beginning, so immune system troubles, chronic pain, um, bowels, digestion that doesn't doesn't work, lots of muscle pain, cardiovascular problems, really low blood pressure, um, all of it, inability to focus, right? No ability to have creativity because we're living in so much shutdown. We go into freeze when we can't fight or flee. So this is the conundrum of the child who is stuck in a abusive, it doesn't have to be physically or sexually abusive, it can be emotionally abusive. Some of the worst trauma I witness is in affluent households where the child can't be perfect enough, parents demand so much, and they literally shut down. They seclude into just reading books and they become the really good kid because they're so good. But what happens a lot and I know this is a generalization, but they realize it's better for them to just be really quiet and really insular and just read because then they don't get into trouble, right? But in that, they're also shutting down the capacity to feel, the capacity to be vibrant, to be full of life force and energy and spunky and creative. So we shut this stuff down. Also, of course, if there is horrific abuse, a little one will survive by shutting down. Okay, this then follows into adult life, into teenage life, and then as we know from the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is the study that pretty much gives us the knowledge that there is a solid connection between early adversity and chronic illness later in life, which is pretty much always a person is in some form of shutdown. When we're in that shutdown under it, is a lot of fight and a lot of flea energy and a lot of terror and a lot of emotion and a lot of pain. So to come out of that freeze, first thing is we need to establish safety. So safety is the first one. And 
on this lovely sheet from video number three, safety. I can't do this upside down. Safety, right? That means, first of all, is it safe in the environment? So this goes back to what Jill was asking. If the environment isn't safe, it's really tough to do this work because our unconscious brain, and this isn't just the amygdala, it's our brain stem, our central nervous system is like, we are in danger still. Even though I'm not being hit or there's not a flood running through my house, I can't be me. It's just like that child. I can't sing when I want to. You know, I've been told to shut up. I've been told that's silly. Don't do that, right? So if we can't express, it's really tough to have safety. So there's safety physically. So clearly being in a war-torn zone or in a flood or earthquake, you know, disastrous ruins isn't going to be safe. But let's just say that things are safe in the environment, but in the environment inside the house, there's friction, there's tension. That needs to shift. If that's impossible, then the next thing is how can a person find safety inside? So again, these are not mutually exclusive. It might mean that one, we do a little bit, and then maybe that person finds safety once a week because they go see a friend for tea and that gives them a feeling of safety, like, oh, this feels good. So let's just say environmental safety is important, so that's number one. Number two, how can we cultivate a felt sense of safety internally? So let's take an example of someone that has really um, chronic pain. The question to find or to ask is, how can we find somewhere in the body that is a little less painful. It isn't useful to say, I want you to find somewhere in your body that has no pain. For someone that has really chronic pain, that would be a very hard thing to do. So it might be, is there somewhere that has a little less pain? And they might, they might go, well, this is gonna sound really strange, but my thumb feels fine. I'm like, great, well, let's feel this thumb, right? Or maybe it's like, my ears feel pretty okay. I'm like, well, let's just touch those. And you might be surprised that when we find a little spot, a little opening, if I come back to this, that little tiny opening to experience a little bit of safety, a little less pain, it takes up a portion of the brain, a portion of the brain that is focused always on the worst, all of a sudden is like, oh, that's a little bit better. And then it's our job, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, but it's my job in this program to then say that, focus on that. And as small as it is, pretend it is a mountain. It's like Everest. And it's so cool that you can find that one spot. Because if you can find one spot, that means you can probably find another spot. We want to cultivate this internal felt sense safety it does not mean that everything is perfect but it's the possibility that there can be somewhere that's a little less painful so that's the second thing so safety externally finding more safety internally the third would be knowing that underneath this shutdown inside the system is a shitload pardon my french but a lot of terror and a lot more emotion and maybe a lot more pain but that's the stuff that was stuffed inside when you couldn't feel it and express it and be with it when you were really young because a little person this is you know where my heart breaks for little people whose parents are attuned to this they don't understand their emotions they're brand new human beings therefore if we don't have an attuned caregiver which is the case for many people right of us here, there's going to be painful emotions, painful memories, times when we wanted to cry and we had to hold it in our chest. Why do you think so many people have tightness in their chest, tightness in their throat, tightness in their gut? It's because we had to hold that in and not express it, right? The one thing that we think of is that emotions are in the head and in the brain. We interpret that in the brain 
but the emotion and the sensation are in the body from like the neck to the groin this is where everything lives emotionally sensorially of course I can feel my arm right in my my extremities but usually when someone has a real deep sense of sadness or anger or grief it's never in the elbow right usually not it's never in the toe or the knee unless of course they had an injury there but typically the the grief or the pain emotional pain associated let's say with a broken leg will not be in the leg it'll be somewhere in this core right so if you just touch this area gently it doesn't have to be your heart it could be the lung area the liver the guts the groin like all this area is sort of the field of emotion and when we have frozenness in the body when we've had to shut down our emotion this whole area gets shut down this is called interoception I talk about this in video number two um, the seven ways to become your own medicine to become our own medicine we have to learn how to listen to the landscape that is our viscera that is our heart and the blood that flows through and our digestion and our reproduction and all of that stuff so we have to be able to be with right so the first thing with coming out of freeze is is well first of all it's education it's understanding that it even exists the second is environmental safety the third is internal felt sense safety and then the fourth would be knowing that there are going to be very tough qualities that we once held on to that are still there that we will want to be able to be with I always say um, we have to be willing to not fear fear that was an article that I wrote hmm, maybe a month or so ago that article started out as I never finished it the full article was what we have to do in order to heal and the first the first point was we have to be willing to not fear fear that sounds kind of like oh well that's easy it's not easy it takes time but we have to realize that fear is not the problem we need fear if all of a sudden uh, something came rummaging into my house like a burglar I would want to be afraid right if I froze that would not be useful for me I would want to run upstairs find a way to hide that fear response is going to protect me right but what happens is when we've had too many of these threatening responses in our lifetime we become overloaded and then that's where we shut down and we stop knowing how to deal with these reactions and then that's where we hold on to emotion it gets stuck in the body and the body literally can't hold on to it anymore and then that's where the nervous system becomes dysregulated which is what I first started talking about well over an hour ago when that question was asked what are the signs of a dysregulated nervous system right that's what it is so fight flight and freeze are not bad they're not the enemy right we need those this is one thing that's really important to understand when you finish this work that doesn't even make sense because there is no finish in other words even when a person is regulated they will still have to navigate stresses and fear responses right if someone gets so into an accident we will we want their system to mobilize and attack and flood the system with appropriate healing mechanisms but then we want to come down out of it and that's the part that we've really missed which is what I talk about in video number two this capacity to come out of our fight flight freeze and restore regulation back to the system now of course if someone um, has never experienced regulation so this is the caveat that can be really tough sometimes to swallow but it's important to understand if there was no regulation from the beginning right so if a person really was born into a very toxic household and mom was frightened for her, her life when she was pregnant because she never resolved her own traumas therefore she got into an abusive relationship and your grandparents aren't helpful and all this stuff if a little person never got solid regulation this is what developmental trauma is early trauma 
They don't have a map for what it means to be safe. Everything is dangerous. The world is a dangerous place and we're all gonna die. That's what my mentor, Kathy Kane, that's like the buzzwords that she uses. When a person has that rubric that the world is a dangerous place, we're all gonna die, I need to protect, I need to stay vigilant. This is the case for most people that have some kind of mental illness or chronic illness. We need to, first of all, realize, okay, you have no map, right? It's like telling someone, I want you to drive from uh, Paris to Rome. Here's a car. Here's the gas. Here's money. All, you've got everything you need. This is, But then they, they look at the car and they go, but no one ever taught me how to drive. I can't get from Paris to Rome. It's the same kind of thing. So in this work, some folks did learn how to drive really well, right? They had good regulation, but then they had a shock trauma along the way that threw them off, right? This work is still important for that person because in our culture, we've been taught to just kind of shut off our emotions. But the folks that didn't get that driving lesson when they were little, that didn't understand they didn't learn how to shift gears and to look both ways and to feel the engine of the car and you know all these things that make a good driver. If they didn't get that, we need to literally teach, okay, well, this is a car, right? It takes fuel, right? You need to make sure that you, know, you look both ways before you see the red light. There, these are the things when a, when a little person hasn't gotten the good self-regulation apprenticeship from a regulated caregiver we need to reteach that stuff so this question of you know what does it take to come out of freeze this is what it comes down to it seems really like oh my god that's a lot of work it is a lot of work it takes a lot to rebuild a system that never got built properly in the first place um, and most of those listening who have chronic really chronic Ill illness if you're someone who works with people who have chronic illness, this is the level that we have to come back to. Safety, external safety, internal, and then being able to be with really intense, intense fright and fear, emotions, feelings, sensations, without disconnecting. There is a question here, how is dissociation expressed? Dissociation is what occurs when we can't handle something that's intense. So part of this work is being able to feel intensity and not shut off, not blank out, right? It's being able to sense the intense fright and go, oh, I am so scared right now and I'm just gonna stay with it because I can tell and I see around me that no one's trying to harm me. I'm actually okay. Everything written in my body would say otherwise. That makes sense?